The other is that I'm going to start what will probably be a two or th possibly even three session series on, entitled uh, From Abiru to Who Knows Who. The Abiru is the name of the uh, multiple Semitic tribes that infiltrated uh, Palestine in the 13th to 14th century before the birth of Christ. And that's, that's going to take us from the earliest history of the Hebrews and Israelites up to today, because what fascinates me, and I'm not asking all of you to be fascinated by it, but what fascinates me is that the Jewish tribe, and I'm calling it a tribe because it is not a race, it is not a nationality, it is not an eth ethnicity, but it's a, a group of human beings that you can join if you meet certain requirements, and it's a community that you can lead if you meet certain requirements. Just the way certain uh, particularly black soldiers left the white population when they were fighting the Indian tribes, and some of them became members of the various Native American tribes. So you can join a tribe, and if you do certain things, you can be expelled from a tribe. In fact, in terms of expulsion, expulsion is, is classic. In the Middle Ages, if, uh, if a young girl married uh, a Gentile, she would be expelled from the tribe. If she was lucky, she would get away with her life. There, there is a, um, a ritual where the, the father, the, the man, the male in the family, would conduct a, a, a funeral service for her because as far as the tribe was concerned, she was dead. And I'll get into some of the uh, more vicious aspects of that when I actually do the series. Paul, can I ask my question while you're doing that? Yes, you may. That was the comment. The question is, Jews, a tribe, why not a religion? What's the distinction? Are Christians a tribe, not a religion? No, Christians are. Well, Christians are a multiplicity of religions, and Jews are a tribe because to, you do not have to have any particular religion. You do not have to be religious to be a Jew. That's what Joe, Joe Biden said at one point. That they asked him. He said, "You don't have to be." Uh, a Jew to be a, um, what is it, the Z? Zionist. Zionist, he said. That is true. Uh, an incredible, incredibly high number of uh, fundamentalist Christians are Christian Zionists. Um, if that were the topic, topic, I could hold forth for easily two hours on that tragedy, uh, but I don't have the time. Let me tell you what we know from archaeology and from other sources. Somewhere about the 12th or 13th century before Christ, before Jesus was born, a tribe, a, 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 several tribes of Semitic origin, by Semitic I mean they were, their ethnicity was Semitic um, from what, what I'll call the Mesopotamian area between the Tigris and the Euphrates. Uh, came to and infiltrated, is the best way of saying it, infiltrated a multitude of the Canaanite villages that had already established themselves in Palestine. Those uh, Semitic tribes had a common or relatively common family history. They called the patriarch, their original patriarch, they called Abraham, and they had a multitude of family traditions including the family history of Abraham to Isaac to Jacob and to Joseph, a multitude of, uh, of stories that 
some of which were borrowed and or reshaped from the surrounding culture, Mesopotamian and Egyptian culture. And the first outside evidence we have of that infiltration, because apparently some of these tribes reckon that they were, they call themselves uh, descendants of Israel, and we have from the Merneptah Stella uh, the conquest of a portion of Palestine. Merneptah was a uh, was one of the pharaohs, or at least was writing for one of the pharaohs. And uh, in the Stella it says, uh, Israel is conquered and her seed is no more. So we, that's the first outside reference we have to anything related to a, a tribe and or nation called Israel. Um, sometime later, in the 8th century BC, we have the reference from a king who was reigning over the area around some Damascus, and he had successfully conquered both uh, what the Bible refers to as, as Judea and Israel. Judea being the southern uh, kingdom and Israel being the northern kingdom of these two kingdoms that were formed by the tribes that I mentioned were, had infiltrated several centuries earlier. And this king of Damascus uh, said that he had successfully defeated uh, the monarchy um, of David, which is our first reference to the uh, monarchy of David, as well as Israel. So those are our outside sources for that time. Who was that king? I don't recall his name in all candor, but I can't get it for you. And you're saying 8th century? B.C.? Yes. Doesn't Abraham start with... No, 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 century? no. I didn't say Abraham was at the 8th century. I said they had a multitude of family traditions and that their family traditions said that Abraham was their father. So they weren't... I'm not saying that Abraham is dated to the 8th century. I'm saying that these tribes that infiltrated Canaanite villages dated their association as a tribe back to a family tree. Am I communicating? A little bit. <laughs> this, we don't have dates. It's, just, it's as if I were to say that I am related to the cupbearer for King Henry VIII. I don't know when King Henry VIII live and or reign. You could do external research and find out when King Henry VIII lived and reigned, and if I was accurate in saying that my lineage goes back to the cupbearer, you would know how far back my lineage went. But the links between those two statements of fact are at the very best fuzzy, because we have traditions about Abraham, we have these family traditions about Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. We have a, a series of stories about judges. By judges we mean local chieftains who managed this disaster or this crisis in the lives of one of these tribes, in the history of one of these tribes. Because we don't have any written documentation apart from these his, uh, family histories and family trees. Okay? So I'm, I, I'm telling you what I know from external history. I'm not attributing any historical accuracy to the family histories or to the family trees, except to say that this is what the family considered their history to be. So you're saying that these people in 1200 B.C. <coughs> claim to be descendants of Abraham's family. And, I mean, they, well, from, from well, way back when. The and when, whether they were or not, yeah. you don't know, but you're saying that that's, they're claiming that and they... And when I mention okay. the 12th century B.C., that's a people who, whose name was Israel, and they were conquered by the Pharaoh of Egypt. 
along with a multitude of other tribes in the Palestinian area because the Egyptian monarchies, the, the Egyptian kingdom was in charge for most of that time period over the... Uh, what I'm talking about now are a set of tribes pre-Christian, okay. pre-Babylonian kingdom, pre-Persian kingdom. So we're talking about a bunch of uh, Asiatic or uh, West Asiatic tribes that are reflected in Babylonian mm -hmm. literature uh, because there are, we have a multitude of archaeological um, evidence from multiple um, kingdoms both in Egypt and in the Tigris-Euphrates area and the section between the Tigris-Euphrates area and Egypt is called the Levant. It is basically a highway from the two sites of major civilization. If you think of where Iraq is now, Iraq and that tip of Syria, and where Egypt sits, you've got an ex expanse of land in between them that was basically, basically a multitude of corridors with a multitude of tribes and a multitude of city-states that were basically uh, way stations. Think of them as, as, as large stops on I-80 between the Babylonian kingdoms and the Egyptian kingdoms. Because the major commercial centers, the major cultural centers, were Babylonia between the Tigris and the Euphrates River, the Nile Valley, and what is now Turkey or Asia Minor, and the Greek sphere of influence up in the what I would call the north, yes, the northeastern section of the Mediterranean Sea. The, the tribes that, that I'm tribe. talking about yeah, yeah, yeah. are the Zar. The, no, the, 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 the tribes you're talking about. They came from uh, the Mesopotamian area. Okay. They were semi-nomadic. They, they moved with their cattle and sheep. Okay. And on one occasion or another, they settled down. These tribes had their own family history, and they accumulated further history as they established two kingdoms. One was called Judea, and the other was called Israel. Uh, the assertion is, and it is probably correct, that for a very short period of time they were united under one king and his offspring. But very shortly after, thereafter, they divided into the two kingdoms called, that they, they themselves called themselves Judah and Israel. The United Kingdom supposedly had a king by the name of Solomon uh, who had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And the only reason I'm mentioning that is that uh, since Egypt and what was the... Um, Assyria. Assyria was the other major power at this point in time. Between Assyria and Egypt you had a multitude of little kingdoms and for the king of the United Kingdom to have that large a harem, um, he would have had to have alliances with every single village between the Tigris-Euphrates Valley and Egypt. So the probability is very high that there is a great deal of uh, exaggeration in at least parts of this family history. The kingdom of Judah survived the destruction of the kingdom of Israel by the Assyrian uh, Empire in about 722. And before 722, we have a number of people, a number of people who called themselves, or who were called prophets, who delivered a multitude of messages to both the kingdoms of Judah and the kingdom of Israel. And we find their literature in the Old Testament. Uh, and interestingly enough, the legends that first originated in the southern kingdom of Judah uh, are aware of these 
prophets, but the prophets weren't aware of this literature from the southern kingdom. And that sounds like a, 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 a twisted road to follow. The point that I am making is that the some of the family literature of the south, southern kingdom has to have been later than those prophets from the northern kingdom. Now, the, two, the people in the two kingdoms talked to one another. And there was a, a tribal shrine at Jerusalem that was recognized by the, by the people of Judah. But the people of Israel celebrated worship at a multitude of shrines. One of them is called Bethel, which literally means house of God. So uh, any tall hilltop would serve as an, uh, as an appropriate altar for many of the people in Israel. Uh, that was also the case in Judah, but it was still recognized that this, this, the central place of worship was at the central shrine in Jerusalem. So Israel fell to the Assyrians in 722, and uh, Judah fell to the Babylonians in... There were several times when they, they were captured, when Jerusalem was uh, forced into becoming a vassal state, the way the United Kingdom is now to the uh, United States. Uh, but they were not overrun until 586 B.C. I want to talk about their literature first, and then I'm going to show a short clip. In that time span, there was a family history as recorded by, the, uh, by certain people in the Ju kingdom of Judea, and certain people of and, and different different accounts of the same kind of history by the people of Israel. Those are respectively called the Yahwist and the Yellowist. And the reason I'm giving you those names is that in the family histories that appear to have originated in the southern kingdom, the writer calls the God of Israel, or, or God, the God of these tribes. That's the best way to put it. The, uh, the Yahwist calls the God of these tribes by the name Yahweh. The writer of the family history of the northern kingdoms called the God of these tribes Elohim, which has a very convenient handle for identifying what part of the Hebrew scriptures come from the southern kingdom and which part come from the northern kingdom. There are two other... Can you say that again, that last part, the Elohim, where that distinction is? Yeah, the God of the tribes is called Yahweh yeah. by the southern kingdom, the southern kingdom, and the God of the tribes is called Elohim, which literally means gods, uh -huh. uh, in the northern kingdom, okay. Okay. which is a convenient handle. It's not, an in, it's not a, a, a tried and true rule but it's a very convenient handle. There are two other sources that are pretty well recognized by scholars for the Hebrew Bible or for the Hebrew history. Those sources are called the Deuteronomic or written by the Deuteronomist, which is probably not a single individual but a school of thought, a school of theological thought, and the Priestly Code, which was almost certainly uh, initiated by and expanded by the Priestly Castes, which was primarily from the south, uh, and when the northern kingdom fell, it's uh, clearly apparent that at least some of the people in the northern kingdom fled to Judea from, from Israel. At the time of the fall of the southern kingdom, a large number of the Judeans were physically transported to Babylonia. Now, I'm going to go back a little bit and say, at the time of the fall of the northern kingdom, a large percentage, at least of the intelligentsia and the wealthy, 
were likewise transported from the northern kingdom to Assyria. For reasons that are unclear, we have no further evidence of the existence or, or where those tribes went. They appear to have been absorbed into the other peoples of Assyria, and simply since their god had lost and the Assyrian god had won, they, they presumably became worshippers of whoever the Assyrian god was, and simply disappeared into the mass of humanity. That's one of the things that distinguishes the Judeans, because they did not get absorbed into the uh, rest of the civilization of Babylonia. So we've got four literary sources, two of which started out as oral transmission. And in the ancient world, the people didn't write things down, they memorized them. So we have two oral traditions that subsequently were written down, and these two, liter these two written sources were later combined in a particular fashion with the Deuteronomic source and the priestly source. Not only do we have differences of names of God, but we have differences of, of interest and emphasis. What distinguishes the Deuteronomist is that he has a particular theory of history. Now, I heard it too, but I don't know what's going on. <laughs> the Deuteronomist was, the first writing of Deuteronomy was almost certainly written around 612 BC. And it was found in the temple in Jerusalem and became the excuse for the king, whose name was Josiah at this time, for a major reformation of cultic uh, practices. Not so much um, economic practices, but cultic practices. Uh, and so it's called the second law because theoretically the law was given to Moses on Mount Sinai or in terms of the Elohist, Mount Horeb. And the, the, the book of Deuteronomy and its impact on the rest of the Tanakh Tanakh is another word for Hebrew Bible. Um, it extends to the editing of the rest of the Hebrew Bible. Um, when the Babylonian kingdom was overrun by the Persian kingdom, by the Persian armies, the king of the Persians, his, whose name was Cyrus, had a policy that was quite different from the Babylonians in that he encouraged his local citizenry to um, maintain their practices and at least a, a portion of them to go back to their original homelands. This was kind of unusual, but it was uh, actually fairly good politics. So I, we don't know what other tribes went back to where they initially came from. But Cyrus gave permission to the Jews who self-identified themselves as Judeans to go back to Palestine and reestablish their, their culture and their homeland in that land. He, had a, he added a prerequisite. Before they went back, they had to have a government. They had to have a constitution. They had, had to have some list of rules by which they were going to govern themselves. So some of them straggled back shortly after 539 BC when the Persian king, the next Persian king, or maybe two or three beyond him, sent emissaries to Palestine. He sent a man, a priest by the name of Ezra, and a Persian administrator who was also a Judean by the name of Nehemiah. When the Ezra and Nehemiah got back to investigate what was going on, and you can read about some of this if you go to um, some of the, the latter prophets of the Tanakh, they found 
that the Judeans who had gone back had taken wives from the local population and uh, some of the local population had taken wives from the Judean population. Now I'm going to remind you that not all of the Judeans were expelled to Babylon. So there's a very good probability that they said, you're related to my great-great-grandfather. And some lady said, you're related to my great-great-great-aunt. But not all of them. We have an intermixture of tribes here, okay? And the reason I'm stressing that is when Ezra and Nehemiah got back there, they found substantial intermarriage and that the law code that they had at hand that was almost certainly written down somewhere between 539 when Cyrus said you could go back but that you only, he had to have a government and a constitution and somewhere around 460 somewhere in that time the final constitution for what we now know as the Jews was formalized. Ah, it's turning itself off. That's okay. We'll, we'll, I will get back to it momentarily. That's important because the Elohist, for example, I don't, how many of you know your know any Old Testament? Dan? A little bit. Oh, and Larry's not here. And Catherine knows a, a fair amount. One of the stories in the Old Testament is where the uh, has the uh, the first originator of the tribe, who's called Abraham, is a is going is being told by God to give a, a demonstration of his faith in God by sacrificing his son Isaac. This was a relatively common Canaanitish practice. We find it abhorrent, but it was practiced in both, the, at least in the northern kingdom and probably in the southern kingdom, in spite of what we think of as local worship service. Uh, there are two different versions of this sacrifice of Isaac. The Eloist does not have the account where an angel appears to him and says, don't harm your son and a ram magically appears with his horns caught in a thicket, and Abraham sacrifices that ram instead of his son. That is the story that's given by the Yahwist. The story that is given by the Eloist has Abraham and Isaac going to the place of sacrifice and never mentions Isaac again. The presumption being that Abraham in, did in fact sacrifice his son Isaac. So we have two different tribal legends. And I call them legends because, well, that's exactly what they are. The one account of the events of, at Mount Sinai has Aaron offering a sacrifice to the golden calf. But another of the literary accounts has no offering given to a golden calf. So I'm, I'm stressing that there are differences in these two sets of family traditions. The Yahwist thinks of God as walking, as, as very anthropomorphized. He, uh, he stitches garments for Adam and Eve for clothing. He enjoys walking in his garden in the evening. The Elohist, and, and very much the priestly source again, uh, see God as transcendent and unapproachable. So that for, for Moses at Mount Horeb, because I'm talking about the Elohist at this point, if you are going to come to the mountain of Horeb, you're at risk of dying because the Elohim, the Elohim is on that and he's only allowing Moses to approach. So there are substantial differences in the way they see 
God, substantial differences in the way they see Moses, and frankly, substantial differences in the way God interacts with his people. In both cases, there is the idea of the tribes establishing a covenant with this God. At the time in which, if anything happened at Mount Sinai, it happened somewhere around 1300 BC. At that time, tribal gods were exactly that. Everyone knew that they were, us, they were given to and had a compact with and had a covenant with a specific God without assuming that this God was the only God around. They, Egyptians assumed that Babylonians had gods, and as I mentioned a, a little while ago, the people who were transported from Israel to Assyria presumably began to worship the Assyrian God, because the Assyrian God was clearly stronger than the Israeli, than the Israelite God. The Israelite God lost. So clearly he's not as powerful as the Assyrian God, okay? When these family legends were, co co were edited together into one narrative, you were talking about a time in human history where there was an increasing understanding that there was one God not a multitude of gods. It is true that uh, when, when Jews say that uh, Judaism is the first God to embrace monotheism, they're right, um, but they're twisting the facts a little bit because if you talk about anything that happened at Mount Sinai, they were not embracing monotheism. They were embracing henotheism, that they were accepting one God as their God without denying the reality of other gods. By the time the priestly Deuteronomic Code was edited, between 400 and 500 BC, there was substantially more agreement that if there was a God, there was one God. Paul, can I ask a question? So let's take, let's take Abraham's, the story of Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac. Yeah. There's a biblical version. What is there was your, one biblical version when the editors finished. What is what I was going to say? What is your reference for a, a version that did not have the angel appear and did not have Isaac saved? Where's your reference for that? Well, I'm going to give you a couple here, but okay. uh, we're talking about the documentary hypothesis that at different points in time. Some editor takes two copies and blends them into one. In order to do that, you have to take the one and do a process of dissection. Now, I did this in the New Testament. Shall I take a... a sh yeah, I'll take a, a few moments. In the New Testament, there are four accounts of the life of Jesus. Three are very similar, and they're called the Synoptic Gospels. The Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Mark, and the Gospel of Luke. The documentary hypothesis, especially as applied to the New Testament at this point in time, asserts that Matthew and Luke used Mark as one of their sources. And you can find a whole lot of places where Matthew and Luke appear to have copied Mark verbatim in large, substantial sections. In addition to that, however, Matthew and Luke had a separate source. The German scholars call it Quella, and most American scholars shorten it to Q. I did my doctoral dissertation on Q, and I isolated what I believe was Q in Matthew and what is Q in Luke. Now, I know Matthew's theology, and I know Luke's theology. So when I find portions of Q that smell like Matthew, 
They're clearly loop, but they have they have they had the shirt waist sticking out. And Mark and Matthew typically leaves the shirt waist tipping clip. Uh, I'm using it this allegorically, obviously. If the shirt waist is sticking out on a certain portion of Q, I think Matthew probably inserted those few words. And if there's a particular emphasis in Luke, if Luke changes a peasant into a um, Samaritan, I say, you know, I know how the parables go, and it's very probable that Luke changed a Jewish peasant into a non-Jewish Samaritan, because that's, that's the nature of Luke's theology. So in the process of doing that, I was able to isolate a major portion of Q. So I'm much less skeptical about the documentary hypothesis than people who haven't worked closely with it. When you get to the Old Testament, and one of the scholars that I will show you is quite skeptical of it, it's much more difficult. But it is easy to separate out certain sections of the Yahweh's document and the Elohist document. And in the, when you isolate those portions of the Elohist document, he talks about Abraham and he talks about Isaac. But he doesn't mention Isaac again. Now, he does talk about Jacob and Joseph further along the line. So I don't know what else was lost there. But at least the people who um, tend to rely on the documentary hypothesis think that that particular element of the Eloist account asserted that or, or implied that Abraham actually went ahead with the sacrifice, which would have been totally normal. In Canaanite society, it would have been totally normal to sacrifice the firstborn. We may consider it barbaric, and I, I would agree with you. But in Canaanite society, it was totally normal. All of that precedes the, the subsequent editing of the book of Deuteronomy, and the rest of the historical books of the Tanakh. What is crucial in terms of the development of, of the Jewish tribe is that the Jewish tribe, as described by the priestly documents and as described by the Deuteronomist documents, must be separated from the other tribes of the world in a radical fashion. In a sacramental fashion, if you were to touch a non-Jew, you would become, under certain circumstances, you would become ritually unclean. And you would have to wash away that ritual uncleanness by certain procedures. If the Samaritan... Is everyone familiar with the parable of the Good Samaritan? even those of you who don't have a Sunday school background. Nod your head if you're familiar with the spirits. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 there are a few heads that I didn't see not. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, it only appears in Luke. Which is not that. Okay? The introduction to the parable of the Good Samaritan appears in both Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Okay? So we have good reason to think that the introduction is both Markan and, and is solidly in the Christian tradition. Now, in the Lucan tradition, or, or let me put it, as in the fashion that parables develop, they are shaped by the person who tells the parable, and if there is a need to, they are shaped by the person who relays the parable. Am I making sense? Luke is concerned 
with justifying the, the presence of Goyim in the Christian church, non-Jews. If you look at the parable of the Good Samaritan, the, the initiation of the parable of the Good Samaritan is the question, who is my neighbor? Okay? In terms of good rabbinic theology of Jesus' time, the answer to that question is another Jew. I want that to soak in for a moment. By the time Jesus was teaching, the answer to the question as to who is my neighbor was not another human being. The answer to that question was another Jew. Now, how is Jesus going to fashion that parable in order to answer the question, who is my neighbor? Is he going to pick the least worthy Jew or is he going to pick a non-Jew? The least worthy Jew who is despised by the rabbis as ignorant as totally ignoring, usually for economic reasons, ignoring all of the rules that have been given him by the Torah. Luke is interested in justifying Gentile Christians. Jesus is interested, in my opinion, in humiliating the Jew who is so, who is so caught up in his cultic observance of the rules that he doesn't know who his neighbor is. So I would submit, on the basis of knowing Luke's theology, that the original form of the parable of the Good Samaritan was a totally non-observant, usually for economic reasons, a totally non-observant Jew. Because Jesus wasn't trying to say anything about Gentiles at that point. Jesus was attacking the rabbinic system precisely using the rabbinic fashion of logic. Now, we're, uh, I'm getting way ahead of where I wanted to at this point, but I want, I am in this, at this point in time, I'm justifying the use of the documentary hypothesis to demonstrate that what Ezra and Nehemiah were imposing on the Jewish tribe in 450 BC was not what the Jewish tribe was agreeing to in 1300 BC. In fact, that whole evolution, the Deuteronomic theory, was developed within 50 to 100 years of, of Nehemiah and Ezra imposing it. And when Ezra and Nehemiah imposed it, Scripture itself says the people wept. I want you to imagine for a moment, you're talking about a tribe who is dispossessing a significant number of women who have been in the tribe for between one day and four years. And you're telling the women of the other tribe, uh, the the Judeans who co-married, you're telling them, you got to choose, you're either a Judean or you're one, or, or you're with them. Like George Bush said, you're either with us or you're with the outsiders. I would submit that it's no wonder that there was quite weeping at that time. It's the Deuteronomic theory of history that has a whole lot to do with the shaping of the Judean tribe. Because the, Jew, the Deuteronomic theory of history says you will be separated from them on, at every single point. It would be easy to live in society with a non-Jew if, for example, a multitude of the dietary rules were different. 
and the majority, not all, but the majority of dietary rules are rabbinic interpretations of what the Tanakh says. Contemporarily, in Orthodox Judaism, there is a separate set of utensils for cooking with uh, meat and for cooking with milk. The origin of that statement is the assertion, is the instruction that you shall not boil the kid in its mother's milk, almost certainly a reference to some Canaanitish cultic practice. We'll get into this a little later on, but what the rabbis have done with the Tanakh has a whole, whole, whole lot to do with forcing the Jewish tribe to be different, to forcing the Jewish tribe to see the non-Jew as a persecutor, and to forcing the Jewish tribe to see the non-Jew as subhuman. Now, I haven't proved that yet. I fully, I'm fully aware of that. But we will, I'll deal with that, because this, uh, the nature of the priestly Deuteronomic code is a whole lot different, and the, the, the reason the code is shaped that way you can call it sociologic genius, if you will, but it is shaped that way precisely so that the Deuteronomist would be sure that the tribe wouldn't commit the same errors as the people of Israel did a few hundred years earlier. The Deuteronomic theory as to why the Israelites were conquered was that they, they broke God's rules. His theory was that the Jewish tribe prospered when they obeyed God and they suffered calamity when they disobeyed God. Frankly, a number of Christians have adopted that same point of view and it's an impossible view of history. But it is the view of history of the Deuteronomist. And it is the view of history that was imposed on the Jewish tribe by Ezra and Nehemiah. I'm open to questions because I want to get this working again because now I want to show you a few short videos. So I'm open to questions. So is your goal to try to get us to see what, how you view the Jewish progression up to today? Yes. The different tribes. That's what the, this is about. And and you you may dig, you're obviously diverting from biblical scripture and in, in doing that. You I am looking at scripture as an analyst rather than as a believer. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to figure out where we were going with this. I am, no, that's a very, very appropriate. I'm glad you asked it, Captain, because if I wasn't clear about that earlier, I want to be clear about it. I'm looking at both... Uh, I'm looking at human history as an analyst. Um, I would look at Islamic history the same way, and I would look at Christian history the same way. Uh, at this point in time, I find it... I personally find it much more interesting to look at it as an analyst, and one of the people I'm going to show you is a very intelligent person. She is, with one exception, the videos I have to show you are by people who are believers. And you'll easily recognize the one video where, it's, uh, where he's talking as an unbeliever because he's talking in strictly analytical terms. But for understanding the relationship between what the Jewish tribe is today is very closely, closely related to what Ezra and Nehemiah did 2,400 years ago. The American media, which is dominated by the tribe, for better or for worse, that's, that's a fact. A friend of mine said it's not anti-Semitic if it's true, so I'm relying on that. Um, the Western media is dominated by it, and if it doesn't get into the Western media, it didn't happen. Okay. For me, cognitive dissonance, what you mentioned first, I think it, this, this is funny, because when I first started getting into history, my brother, it, he was somewhat into it, but I found it interesting, is that uh, my partner at the time is from South America, and he came with me to Serbia. 
and I was just there for the first year and I got this book and I was telling my mom there's a side which was only in English and the other side was in Serbian and it was about this ancient culture and all this stuff and I was reading it and I was reading it I read it in Serbian first and then I wanted to translate to my boyfriend the the side so I had to do English was easier for me to translate English to Spanish so when I started reading the English side what I found so interesting and it's a, a, a a book that was published even in the US I guess and was being lots of things were left out in the English version and I was just in shock I was like how, how was this not in and I thought it was so bizarre to me I don't know who's behind that but I found it very suspicious why a part of a book would not in one language would leave out you know I, it, I just found that bizarre for example so I don't know how that's even possible to do something like that let me give you another example uh, I think everyone here will admit, uh, agree that uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn is at least one, if not the premier um, Russian writer of the 20th century. One book, and only one book of his, has not appeared commercially in English translation. It's now fortunately available online, but it's not available commercially. And that is his book entitled 200 Years Together, wow. discussing the relationship of Russian Jews with Russians. Wow. So, what it is online now. 200 years it's ago. online, but it's, not, but it's not commercially available. That's interesting. I would say, though, I don't think there's any question that there were thousands and thousands of years pre patriarchal. And I think it's possible to get too simplistic about, you know, that was good and this is bad. Yeah, I, mean, I don't think that's but pre patriarchal, but I don't know what that means. It means the it means the the patriarch and that's not the best word in the world. Dominate uh Rain Eisler, she's a good example. Dominator, yeah, that she's she talks dominate. about a dominator and a partnership society. And that there were thousands of years of societies that were not warlike, that worshipped the earth, that loved the earth, did not see the earth as. But it's not appropriate to call those people Jews. Pardon me. It's not appropriate no, to call those people Jews. <laughs> she did. Well, oh. she she said there were thousands of Jews that were before the patriarchs. No, 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 no. I didn't say that. I said there's thousands of people okay. that were. Okay. Uh, that, my ears fooled me. I'm yeah, sorry. No, Thousands, hundreds and thousands of years of cultures that were not dominator cultures like what we now live with, where mostly men control, but they also control other men, they control women. I think there are factions, though. I think there's lots of secret societies that are women-based, right. and people and, don't know about them. Yeah, They're, and indigenous tribes yeah. and so on, but that the, the evidence... The world's really changed. <laughs> but the evidence is really there that there were those cultures, and it hasn't found its way into professional archaeological. Can I, can I just, at least my perspective, as I disagree that it's a patriarchal society today. I think it is, but I think it's just anti human society because I don't think anyone in this kind of oppressive society is, you know, because it, it doesn't even. I don't think, with having that disbalance, there isn't any benefit to man, men or women. I think everyone's oppressed in a way. Oh, I so, totally agree with that, yeah. So I'd like I to call it something else that's that you're why saying, I don't like not that patient, word yeah. too much, because it's terrible for men as well as for women. Exactly. Are you both discussing the fact that Western culture is being attacked and we do not yet know who or what is attacking it? Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> well, well, the question is, do we not know what it is? I have my suspicions, but I cannot, this is one of the reasons I'm spending this time on this, because at least the tr a portion of the tribe is a portion of the problem. Mm -hmm. That much I can say with complete confidence. Yeah. Beyond that, I'm still accumulating information. Uh, there's a correlation between Jakob Frank and Adam Weishaupt and the major Rothschild in the last decade of the 18th century that I'm trying very hard to research. But now I'm going back to ancient history. Another similarity is that both the gods Ptah and El 
create the world through their very will, and not through a divine battle between gods. The Jews also seem to be oddly concerned with circumcision, which serves as another connection to Egyptian culture. The earliest historical record of circumcision comes from Egypt in an inscription of a tomb at Saqqara dating to around 2400 BC. While circumcision might have been done for hygienic reasons, it was for the Egyptians part of their obsession with purity and was associated with spiritual and intellectual development. These connections would all make sense considering the Levant was politically and culturally dominated by the Egyptian Empire in the time the Israelites are thought to have arisen by the end of the Late Bronze Period. However, it is probably not until Iron Age I that a population began to identify itself as Israelite, and the Israelite, or the earliest documented instance of the name Israel, is from the Egyptian stele of Merneptah, around 1208 BC, in which it records that Israel is laid waste, and his seed is not. The earliest possible occurrence of the name Yahweh is as a place name in the Egyptian inscription from the time of Amenhotep III, who reigned from 1402 to 1363 BC. It refers to the land of Yahu, which is the land of the Shashu, being nomads from Midian. Thus the worship of Yahweh seems to have originated in areas south of Israel. The name Yahweh, which can take on various forms in the Semitic tongue of Yah for theophoric purposes, for example, Adonijah, which is Adon, master, and Yahu, referring to Yah or Yahweh, contains the core name Yah. Along with being the chief and ruler god, Yahweh shares unequivocal resemblances to the Sumerian god Yah, who is culturally synonymous with Marduk and Baal Hadad. Yah and Yah, or Yahweh, are virtually the same god. The Torah draws heavily from other ancient Near East influences which pre-existed it, incorporating and modifying them. Things such as the laws of Eshnuna, Hammurabi, Middle Assyrian laws, and Urnamu. The covenant theme which runs throughout is known to be directly related to the Hittite suzerainty contracts and the vassal treaties of Esar Hadan. One example of the covenant theme from outside the Hebrew Bible lies in the Phoenician inscribed Arslan Tash amulets, which refer to the Eternal One's covenant, a Council of Holy Ones, and the Sons of El. Interestingly, there's also a 5th century AD Christian amulet from Cyprus which associates Ray and Osiris with Yahweh and Jesus in imagery on one side and a palindrome text on the other, stating, Yahweh is the bearer of the secret name, the Lion of Ray, secure in his shrine. This is interesting because the throne of El is depicted with features of a lion, and the earliest possible instance of El and an artifact depicting him with two lions. The Israelite accounts of creation contain clear allusions to ancient Near Eastern cosmogonies. The first verses draw upon the Babylonian epic Enuma Elis, which means when on high. Both begin with a temporal clause, the book of Genesis beginning with when El created the sky and earth, in which also nothing existed but primeval waters, male and female, fresh and salt, Apsu and Tiamat, respectively. The god Marduk manages to create the world by destroying Tiamat with wind, ripping her asunder and forming the sky and the earth from her carcass. Genesis applies the same styles and motifs of its ancient Near Eastern setting, only demythologized, that lacks any theogony of the gods which the texts discuss. The memory of the battle narrative, though, is preserved in other parts of the Tanakh. There are still significant differences, however, between typical ancient Near East religious traditions and the Hebrew Bible, the most remarkable feature being the suppression of mythology in the Hebrew tradition. There is no biography or theogony of Yahweh. While the Bible is not mythology, it does indeed contain myths and legends. The polemical inversion of the Hebrew narrative, as opposed to other myths, is apparent in the emphasis on human importance and dignity created in divine image, 
which is lacking in the narratives of their ancient Near East neighbors, where humans tend to be menials. Human affairs are the theme of importance in the biblical account, and thus the absence of mythologized stories of gods is substituted with mythologized stories of humans. In that sense, the often suggested question, is the Bible trustworthy in depicting historical events, is a wrong question, to which the answer would be no. A better question would be, is the Bible trustworthy in depicting historical opinions, and the answer to that is an obvious yes. The text of the Torah is constituted of at least five sources as described in Wellhausen's theory. J. Yahuist, written around 950 BC in Judah. E. Elohist, written around 850 BC in Israel. D. Deuteronomist, written around 600 BC in Jerusalem. P. Priestly, written around 535 in Exile of Babylon. And R. Redactor, which is the final edition of the combined sources. Although Wellhausen's dates have been disputed, and any of the sources could be decades, if not centuries later. In fact, the Hebrew Bible itself explicitly admits this sort of phenomena when it cites prior sources at many times. For example, the Book of Jasher, the Book of the Wars of Yahweh, and the Book of Edo, the seer. This is not necessarily a modern idea either of Wellhausen's, considering the fact that similar analysis was concluded by scholars such as Baruch Spinoza, Thomas Hobbes, and John Estruk in the 1600s. In J text, Yahweh is the most anthropomorphic, forming man from clay with his hands, enjoying walks in the cool of evening, stitching clothes for Adam and Eve from animal pelts, enjoying the food Abram cooks for him, speaking face to face with humans, being bargained with, and so forth. J is particularly interested in the traditions of Judah and it supports Judah against Israel, for example, suggesting that Israel acquired its capital at Shechem by massacring the inhabitants. And J supports the priests who descend from Aaron, who were established in Jerusalem, the capital of Judah. While Wellhausen placed the date for J text at around 950 BC, a crucial study by H. H. Schmid demonstrated that J was conscious of the prophetic works of the 7th century BC, while the prophets did not know of the traditions of the Torah, meaning that J cannot be earlier than the 7th century BC. Many current theories place J even later, such as that of Russell E. Gmirkin. E text is characterized by its virtually exclusive use of the plural term Elohim for the deity, along with its use of the phrase fear of God. It holds a rather abstract view of the deity, and strangely uses Horeb instead of Sinai for the mountain where Moses received the laws. E-text, favoring Israel, represents traditions from the northern kingdom of Israel and exhibits a fascination with its heroes such as Joseph and Joshua, speaking negatively of Aaron, for example, claiming that he led the Israelites to worship the golden calf. Before the redactor edited it, E-text told the story of Abraham and Isaac, in which Abraham has not stopped and Isaac never appears again, suggesting rather that Isaac was sacrificed. And the early tradition, recorded in the Midrash, still preserves the version of the tale in which Isaac was killed. While the J text depicts the anthropomorphic god that is involved with humans on earth, the Elohist source frequently involves angels, for example, telling of a ladder of angels that leads up to El, whereas in J, this is simply a dream in which God is above the location. E-text also goes to excessive lengths to depict the Egyptians negatively, and it depicts Moses as threatening Pharaoh and bringing the plagues himself. The priestly source, P-text, is unique among the other sources and is characterized by significant contradictions with them. In P-text, Aaron and the priesthood have an exalted status, and there is no sacrifice ordained by God at Sinai. Ritual laws and origins of shrines are stressed, as is the role of priests. Unique to P is the assertion that only descendants of Aaron were allowed to officiate in the inner sanctum. P's God is majestic and transcendent, and according to P, all things occur because of his power. Also unique to P is that the deity reveals himself in stages, first as Elohim, 
then as El Shaddai to Abram, and then as Yahweh, only to Moses and those following him. In Exodus 6.3, Yahweh reveals his name to Moses, saying that no one had yet known this name, and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob only knew him as El Shaddai. But according to J-Text in Genesis 15, Abraham clearly knows the name of Yahweh, and Yahweh himself says, I am Yahweh. P is significantly concerned with holiness, meaning ritual purity, and Israel is posited as a priestly kingdom and holy nation, with elaborate rules that are aimed at preserving this purity. Most scholars agree that P source was written either during or after the exilic period around 530 BC. The Deuteronomist source, although found mostly in Deuteronomy through 2 Kings, underlies much of the Hebrew Bible. The Deuteronomistic history originated independently of the books Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, and the history found in the Book of the Chronicles. Scholars trace all or most of it to the 6th century BC. It tells of a story in which a book of the law was supposedly found during the reign of King Josiah, and which caused the king to embark on a series of religious changes. And it has been suggested that the source this source was manufactured in order to validate his program of religious change. Deuteronomist theology is conceived in the form of the suzerainty or covenant between Israel and Yahweh, who elected them and requires them to live according to his law. Under this treaty, Yahweh has granted a conditional promise to the Israelites of the land of Canaan. The interpretation asserted in D-Text explains Israel's successes as the result of obedience and its failures as the result of disobedience. Contrary to the other three texts, in which independent shrines or priesthoods are represented as legitimate, D-Text insists on a centralized worship around the temple in Jerusalem. Lastly, D-Text asserts all Israelites as brothers and sisters, and each will answer to God for his treatment of his neighbor. These four texts were combined at two points in time by editors or redactors, who appear to have kept as much as possible from the source documents, firstly by combining J and E to form JE. The redactor of JE is thought to have added very little, only a few phrases in the attempt to remove serious contradictions and maintain the flow of the story between the texts. The main exception to this is in the story of Abraham sacrificing Isaac, where the redactor added an angel stopping Abraham and replacing the boy with a ram. During the Babylonian exile, J.E. was unified with P and E by a different redactor, which many theorized to be Ezra during the time of Cyrus the Great. And that, as we have it, is the combined sources of the Hebrew Bible. That's a, a good place to terminate because um, where the tribe goes from the... Um, the establishment of the great congregation with Ezra is is a is a lot of material that we are not going to cover today. It occurred to me that I'm going to emphasize that the Deuteronomic theory of history had everything to do with what the tribe was shaped by and shaped uh, through rabbinic interpretation. Uh, as one footnote to the earlier conversation about the role of the female, uh, the Israelites were probably the first to remove Asherah from her uh, relationship with Baal or with Yah, uh, so that it was that association existed in the Canaanite uh, religions but it was at least edited out of the family traditions that constituted J and E. That's in the Old Testament. No, Asherah is not. I think it, well, I haven't looked at it for a while, but I think it is. So this is one view. I mean, when this person <clears throat> says, you know, that there's lots of myths and legends in the Bible, I personally would disagree with that. I understand. That's that's this is this one. While you person. were out, I congratulate. I, I I gave you words of praise for dealing with the cognitive dis dissonance because I, I we've had yeah. this chat before, and and I, I'll say it to the rest of the group. 
you have dealt with substantial cognitive dissonance, and I, I applaud you for that. Yeah. So this is one view. Who was the speaker? Don't know. So where you don't know. Well, I know the Wellhausen theory of document uh, of the documentary hypothesis. That's uh, that's you can yeah. fill five bookshelves with that. Okay. If you look up the either the Wellhausen documentary hypothesis or just the documentary hypothesis or the JEDP hypothesis, you'll get a wealth of information online. Well, it's saying that Deuteronomy was sort of created in the time of just of King Josiah. That's that's an alternative view. Well, actually, well, I'd, oh, instead of being written by Moses. Yeah. Ah, you're going to have to look real hard to find someone who holds that view. Mm -hmm. I mean, even among evangelicals. Or you could say you'd have to look pretty hard to find somebody who thought that King Josiah just, lo and behold, found this Deuteronomy and uh, it just fit his uh, program. That is a possibility. Your criticism is it that that it uh, you don't consider it just legends or right. okay, yeah. which I think is is a sign of the point of of how it came about. I think, like you said, yeah. I think it's a, you can you agree to disagree yeah. on the of on course. the belief belief aspect of, of it, course, which because I think is okay. nobody's really nobody really at, at best Paul could say well nobody really knows. I can say. Uh, in, in my opinion, Islam, uh, Judaism, and Christianity are all, I'm sorry, I don't know, have, a, have another word for it, patriarchal, dominated, uh, but when they get hooked up with the government, I think they all have valid spiritual teachings, but as soon as they're, and that happened with Christianity, which was breaking away from some of the harsh stuff of Judaism, it happened with Christianity um, once it got accepted by what was the name Constantine. And I heard somebody describe the Israeli government as uh, that Judaism had become Constantinized. In other words, it got taken over by a harsh fascist government. And we'll I think we'll Christianity had been right taken over by our harsh fascist government. But it's one of those things, I think, the consciousness behind whatever, if you're call, calling it the Jesus consciousness and people believing in that concept, mm -hmm. I think it, that's where people are divided and depending on what they're religious. Or I think I, I would consider that even being an atheist is a form of religion because it's a thought process that a person has. You don't believe and that's fine. And I think that, that shouldn't be the thing that divides people, I think. What we can agree on are the things that maybe can be recorded or they can be taken into interpretation, but I, I think that um, all of these, you know, even if it was a movement, you have to think what was motivated behind the action. So you're saying, did you think he just came up with it? Or did he, was he inspired in some way from a higher power? I think that's, that's up to interpretation. I mean, if you if you believe it, you're a believer, and if you're not a believer, you're not a believer, and that's fine. But I think that's what divides. I think you know what what you're saying, and I I agree that everyone is up to their own whatever they have as their own belief. But I don't think actually the major religion in the United States today is scientism. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was going to say. I think there's so that that's also a religion. Yeah, it's definitely a religion. I agree with it. I, I just I was just telling mom about um, I was listening about CERN and about you know particles and you know acceleration and everything yet they have a symbol of Shiva on as their you know and they came out with a tarot deck and all of these things and I think it's very interesting for an organization that's just science based why does it have these you know um, religious uh, or not religious spiritual or esoteric things uh, linked to it I just think it's bizarre so I think it's a question you can't get to the bottom of, like you said, but I think it's a question that should be asked. And like, like you were saying, you don't know who's behind it, but what are what what is it that they're looking after? If it's power, is it to dominate in what way for resources or for just consciousness of people? What are, what are they trying to 
I don't know, that's up to interpretation of each individual. I think the frontier yeah. of science is combining spirituality and science. Mm -hmm. I think that's where... Is what? I think that's the frontier of science. Is to... those who are looking at the two realms and seeing how they're combined. Which two realms? Spirituality and scientific. I would submit that with a very small number of people, the realm of science is to preserve the status quo and to pretend that they have the answers. That, yeah, and I think yeah. that's mainstream science who, and they, I mean, they are really uh, uh, dogmatic oh, yeah. in their unwillingness to accept this other way of looking at things. 